Hi, welcome to the Bloom podcast, talking about the different ways people get through tough times. He's Steve, a clinical hypnotherapist. And she's Susie, parent and cake baker, currently going through treatment for breast cancer. Today we talk about talk, why and how therapy can help. Steve tells us how he became a hypnotherapist. I find out what's been giving Susie the heebie-jeebies this week. And we have a very special guest, Dr. Mark Cross. The self-confessed anxious shrink. He gives us some great advice on how to stave off anxiety. And confesses that he finds it very hard to take his own advice. Hey Susie. Hey Steve. How is he? Ah, he's... He's surprisingly chipper. He's very happy. He even went to school the day after it happened, mainly so he could show off his arm in a <laughs> in a sling, I think. <laughs> but uh, it was it was. T- uh, I, I still feel ill thinking about it. Tell us what happened. So my stepson Max was riding to school, as is his wont. Um, he's he's ridden to school for five years now. He's fifteen. I came home and my husband from from dropping the other kids. And my husband said, um, "Okay, just uh, just put that." I, I was eating. He said, oh, "Just put down your spoon." Um, Max was clipped by a car on the way to school, so he didn't say hit by a car. He said clipped by a car. Taken off to hospital, X-rayed, no breaks. There's a possible. There's a query on a hairline fracture, lots of bruises, and very very happy spirits. <laughs> but, but, but you perhaps not so much. <laughs> Uh, I feel like I actually feel like I've been waiting for this to happen for five years. He heads off every morning and we go, bye. And I go, ride safe, right, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and there we have it. Oh, my word. I've told him from now on I want high-vis vests. I want him lit up like a Christmas tree <laughs> if there are lights that flash and jingle and anything, <laughs> anything. I'm just going to go and buy out a, a safety shop. Um, he's he's going to keep on riding. He loves riding, and I don't want to take that away. It, it it makes me anxious. Did you say you'd sort of been expecting this moment for the last five years? Or that's in part because um, certainly when he was younger, I'd see him riding along, and he'd be waving at me, and I'd be there in the car going, "Get your eyes back on the road." <laughs> <laughs> this small boy cheerfully waving his arms and oh lordy and I, I there's me in the car thinking he's about to die in front of me <laughs> um <laughs> so he's obviously he's much older now he's he's riding a bit further now as well because the secondary school's further away than the primary school was it's been a concern for me every day and I've tried to to not I mean it's normal right that kids ride to school He's not doing something exceptionally dangerous, um, unless you think that being on a bike at all is exceptionally dangerous. So I try and not feel panicky about that. But, yeah, I don't like it. It's hard, isn't it, getting that that balance between protecting them, wrapping them in cotton wool, um, and, and thereby damaging them because we end up preventing them from being able to fend for themselves. On the other hand, knowing that cars and, and children on bicycles can can come together in a most awful way. It's probably some kind of metaphor for parenting, actually, or metonym, because it's like everything else. You want them to do the thing that makes them happy, that they enjoy. You don't want to slow them down. You want to keep it at the right level for them. And as a parent, it well, I was going to say it frightens you, but I, I don't know. Does it frighten you? It frightens me. Yes, but I'm, and I'm, I'm going to risk a big generalisation here. I wonder if typically fathers and and mothers or or men and women might have different approaches to this. I think as a generalization, I observe men perhaps not worrying about things so much and maybe not worrying enough. I remember recently walking along the the beach and there was a a father walking along with his phone, you know, peering into his phone while his three or four year old on a little trike was about 10 meters away from him and had fallen over and dad wasn't even noticing. I don't know if that, that generalization holds at all. Do you think, is there anything to that? It's difficult when you're talking about gender generalizations, isn't it? You, I mean, no one likes them, but, or I don't anyway, I don't feel comfortable with it. I think I know more, I certainly know some anxious, very careful dads, but I probably know more anxious mums. I've got a, a crap theory or two crap theories. One is that in the traditional arrangement, this doesn't actually apply with, with you and Max in this specifically, but in the traditional arrangement where mum has carried the baby for nine months in her body, I, I, 
I think that creates a, a different kind of bond or intimacy than father's role. I, and the other one is, I think, blokes in general lack imagination compared with women. I think women are seem to be able to construct the most elaborate horror fantasies of what can go wrong in in fine detail, which always always shocks and surprises me when I hear it. <laughs> I mean, you're right that the the physiological explanation doesn't work for step parents or adopt or stepmothers or adoptive mothers either. Those are the non gestational mothers. Do do blokes lack imagination? My imagination seems particularly well placed to visualise all the horrific things that can happen to my children. So I'm not using this this fantastic imagination to write novels or, or paint pictures. I'm just using it to picture the the uh, the accident prone children. Why torture yourself with something that may never happen. I know you're not doing it. Deli- I'm not suggesting you're deliberately doing this, but what what what's the kind of if you like the evolutionary advantage of it? Why do why does it happen? I am stuffed if I know. I mean, the 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 only possible evolutionary advantage would be to make a parent more careful, I suppose. I'll just say at this point, I really try and fight it and try and go with what's reasonable. I mean, you notice that I'm not saying Max never gets to ride his bike again. I'm, mm. I'm saying that he should, we need to up his level of uh, of safety equipment and, and so on. And we've already done all the obvious things like made sure that he's, he's rides on, on quiet streets and all that kind of thing. If my inclination is to go all out and have no children ever leave the house ever again, I know that that's not reasonable. I'm trying to find that middle ground, letting them stretch themselves while not overstretching me. But back to what is what is the purpose of worry? I don't subscribe to magical thinking. I don't think that the more I worry, the less likely it is to happen. Or, And I know perfectly well, by the way, that the things that you worry about are almost always the things that, not the things that actually happen. A couple of years ago, my daughter got quite a bad concussion. She was out of school for six weeks. She was, um, it was very frightening. Well, she got that just, just being on a swing in a playground. So again, there are times she's, she's climbed trees. She's done things that I'm screaming on the inside. Um, and sometimes on the outside too. The time she actually injured herself quite badly, she was just in a normal playground doing normal playground things. I know that the worry doesn't protect them. I remember a Polish person telling me that it, it, it's very much part of the Polish psyche not to think about things turning out well, because almost by doing so, you're cursing them not to happen. You know, logically, that doesn't really work. You can sort of see that. It's something about, you know, counting your chickens before they're hatched. And, and you know, I suppose the obverse would be would be true as well. That if you imagine these worries, then at some level, it's going to it's going to help you protect them from happening. I'm not sure what to say about that. I don't think that that is what happens in my head. Maybe it does for other people. For me, the the anxiety that comes is not particularly. It's you know what? It's not welcome. I don't think it brings protection. I don't think it really helps me prepare particularly. I remember um, reading that the kind of person who standing near to the edge of a very high place and has a, a flash thought perhaps jumping or perhaps falling off um, walking along the the street and you see cars come in the opposite direction and the thought occurs to you that if you if you just stepped into that traffic that actually that sort of person is less likely to do it apparently that it that it's it's its purpose seems to be something like warning you against doing things by making you aware of the possibility of them I don't know if that's got anything to do with what we're talking about here. I was interested in what you were saying before about being aware of what's reasonable. That suggests a kind of level of uh, metacognition about the whole thing, you know, thinking about your own reactions and being able to gauge whether they're reasonable or not. That presumably people who worry excessively and would then say, right, that's it, Max, you're never getting on a bike again and actually genuinely mean it and sell the bike, they're not doing that or they're not not capable of doing that. Yes, there is a sort of a, a proof test is it normal and reasonable to ride your bike to school I mean I know that I'm pretty sure that my mother thinks I'm an incredibly careless parent by the way because I do allow kids to ride to school and various other things that she she considers way too dangerous reckless reckless (laughs) riding off to school without a care in the world that must play into how you your parenting style you must have got it from somewhere these things don't come out of the ether and presumably how you're brought up must make a a difference i mean it could be that you end up reacting against the way that you were brought up you know if you were brought up very very strictly you might allow your children a lot more leeway or vice versa so it doesn't it's not doesn't necessarily mean that you're that one is fated to repeat but it must have an influence mustn't it Oh, I think so. I mean, I, I, I maybe I come from.
from a long line of anxious mothers who've, who've worried at their daughters down the generations. And I'm speaking for my mother there. I haven't actually asked her, too frightened what she might say if I said, do you think it's okay that the, that the kids ride their bikes to school? Being a parent is a lot about, for me, responding to the way I was brought up and taking the bits that worked really well for me and, and repeating that with my kids and then rejecting other bits and trying something different. This isn't strictly relevant, but it just reminded me of something that I find quite touching that I quite often talk to clients. Say a, a bloke who was brought up by an old-fashioned Australian father who is quite reserved and quite strict and never said I love you and, and rarely hugged. And often the guy will say that he is he has consciously gone in the opposite direction and he tells his kids all the time that he loves them and you know hugs them and, and goes to their school things and so on. And, and I love that thought because that's presumably something that's been handed down for, for generations and generations and you're kind of breaking the cycle and changing things for your offspring. That's a very nice image. Is he uh, at the same time saying, just be careful on that footpath. Hey, Steve. Hey, Susie. I've been reading Mark Cross's book, Anxiety, and it's it's great. I really like it a lot. I just came across this bit. There are more than 150 types of talk therapy. <laughs> what is going on there? And I'm asking you because presumably what you do is, is classified as one of those. As a hypnotherapist, yes, it certainly is. So what are the other 149? Do you want me to list them alphabetically or by school or grouping? <laughs> How long is this episode going to be? <laughs> That's an amazing thing, isn't it? And I, I've heard much higher figures than that. That gives us a clue that there really aren't that number of different kinds of talk therapy. There are some differences. You can use different techniques for different presenting issues. But I do think that there's been such a manualization and such a creation of schools of thought and approaches. And they all follow the witch doctor medicine route, which is to say there are 41 active ingredients and nobody knows what the hell they are. But so long as you do all of these 41, it seems to work. So do all 41 and don't change challenge or do anything different. Do you know the joke, witch doctor? <laughs> no. <laughs> and the answer is no, just an ordinary GP. <laughs> If you're, a, if you're someone who's looking for some therapy, as I have been it, at certain points in my life, how do you figure out who you're going to go and see and what kind of therapy is the right kind for you? And Because it's such an important relationship, isn't it? Not just the type of therapy, but do you like the person? Do you feel comfortable with them? Are you happy to reveal? Do you have that trust relationship? If it doesn't feel right, then walk away. You don't have to really enjoy the company of your proctologist or a surgeon if you know that they're outstanding in their field it doesn't matter so much if they've got a poor bedside manner. But with talk therapy, with any kind of therapy where you're going to someone for help, I think you've really got to feel that they're present for you, that they're actually seeing you. Myself, I would run a mile if I thought that I was made to fit the therapy rather than the therapy being made to fit me, which is to say that if someone does one particular type of therapy, if all they do is cognitive behavioral therapy in the morning, cognitive behavioral therapy in the afternoon, and cognitive behavioral therapy in the evening, that's that's not for me. What I want is someone who sees me, who gets me and is tailoring what they're doing to my individual unique needs. For you, it's not the particular type of therapy. It's that the therapy is tailored to suit you by the therapist. But when I mean, you're a hypnotherapist, so isn't all the therapy that you give going to be hypnotherapy or end up being hypnotherapy? You're not going to break out and go all Freudian or start doing CBT, I would assume. And you'd assume wrong, Susie. <laughs> <laughs> because I do. Hypnotherapy actually isn't a therapy. It's it's really, if you like, it's a it's a therapeutic medium. It's a it's a medium in which therapy can happen, and you can use any form of talk therapy. Really, all hypnotherapy is is just the strategic use of language to offer suggestions which are intended to help the person with their particular needs. So I'd I'd like to think that I never do the same thing twice. And yes, I mean, it, it may end up, it usually does end up with hypnosis, but that's, that's really just a way of readying that, you know, of, of, of helping the client to get into a, into a place where they can more easily accept suggestions. Well, I, let me give you an example. My own early experiences of, of hypnotherapy. I remember one in particular, I was going through a 
we as a family were going through a particularly tough time and I was feeling the burden of it and it really did feel like I was kind of collecting the stress in my neck and shoulders. They felt sort of tight and like I was carrying a heavy burden and the image that I had in my mind was of that, you know, that that image of Atlas carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders and that's really what it felt like for me and I went and saw a hypnotherapist and literally in one session uh, she used that image because that's what I'd brought to her. She, you know, she'd she may never have used that before with anybody else or since, but she helped me to visualize and, and kind of really experience that weight on my shoulders and then to experience taking it off. Put that way, that sounds almost kind of hokey. And you think, well, how can that possibly help? But I can tell you, I walked out into the sunshine after that single session and it felt as if the weight of the world had been lifted from my shoulders and it did not return. It didn't solve the problem, but it changed the way that I felt about the problem. How did you get into hypnotherapy? I was exposed to something called NLP, which perhaps some people listening may have heard of, Neuro Linguistic Programming, which has an interesting history in the States in the 70s. Two academics, one a, a linguistics academic and the other a computer guy, and they were looking for strategic uses of language for a, a, a bank of language. They wanted to try and, if you like, deconstruct language and understand better how it works and how you can codify it. And they came across the transcripts of therapy of three therapists, Virginia Satir, who's a very well-known family therapist, Fritz Perls, who developed uh, Gestalt therapy, and this weird cat called Milton Erickson, who just captivated me. I'm the sort of person that always wants to know where these things come from. So I started following back this NLP and, and then came across Milton Erickson, who is a quite extraordinary character, was. He died in 1980, an American psychiatrist who used hypnosis. And that sort of brought me up hard against an intellectual blind spot or prejudice that I had. For somebody with an, a doctorate from Oxford who's supposed to be able to think for himself, I suddenly realized that I had two ideas, two things going in, on in my head about hypnosis. One, I don't know anything at all about hypnosis. Two, but I do know that it's bollocks. And I realized that I needed to find out more about hypnosis so that I could at least satisfy myself that it was indeed bollocks, or maybe that there was something to it. Because if this Milton Erickson cat was using it and getting extraordinary results, and there were many, many people who were reporting over the years that they'd been helped greatly in a very, very brief periods of time by Erickson. So I went and saw a therapist. And it was, a, it was a kind of a life-changing experience for me. Like everyone else, I knew that I couldn't be hypnotized. I didn't know how I knew that. I just knew, of course, I can't be hypnotized. Nobody can be hypnotized. It's all nonsense. Turns out that I, after about a minute and a half or two minutes, I was out like a light and I had no recollection at all of what was said to me. And yet the experience was kind of quite transformative. I was, the time I was traveling around the city of Melbourne here in Victoria in Australia, traveling around visiting various businesses, and I'd kind of developed a mania for hypnosis. And this was at a time 15 years ago when there were still lots of secondhand bookshops. So I would find that I would be compelled to take detours to these bookshops to see if they had any great new stock on hypnosis, because I was consuming the stuff voraciously. I seem to have an insatiable appetite for it. So it, and I remember saying to the hypnotherapist, because she said, well, is there anything you'd like to work on? And I said, no, I, I don't think so, actually, really, not just at the moment. But somehow I've got this strange feeling that this might become important to me. And it did. Here I am as a hypnotherapist. I think a lot of people have that, oh, it's all hokey, oh, can you make me quack like a duck reaction. And uh, the, the confusion with hypnotherapy and, and hypnotism I remember you talking to me about it when I was pregnant and me sneering about the idea that it might help with, uh, with giving birth. I, yes, I remember that because I was sitting in one of the classes. I was actually texting you because there was someone there who was talking about the use of hypnosis in childbirth to help with the pain. Um, and I can remember you <laughs> sneering. And actually, I remember afterwards talking to one of, the, one of my fellow students who she said that she'd had her first child without the benefit of hypnobirthing and then the second and third child with, and that's what caused her to be learning, learning this stuff. And she just talked so convincingly to me about the difference that's a whole other subject. I reckon we might do an episode on this sometime on, on hypnobirthing because it's a fascinating subject. Well, maybe an episode on birthing, actually. 
um, yes. not just the, the hypno side. And I don't think it would have worked very well for me because, you know, two emergency seizures later, there's no way I was doing that with, uh, with hypno, just only hypnotherapy behind yeah. me. So maybe it would have helped me in how I managed the whole situation and how I, uh, the, the bits that went up to the, the emergency seizures. Hmm. Who knows? Not going back to that, thank heavens. So we'll never find <laughs> out. <laughs> so this is interesting because actually I did think of therapists, therapy therapists as sitting in a, a type of box, I suppose. Um, so you're a hypnotherapist, you do hypnotherapy. You're a CBT person, you do CBT. But you're saying that's not the case. That's my view of things. Part of the reason why I was attracted to Ericsson is because he, he explicitly disavowed any, any process, any manual, any approach. And there are plenty of stories of people coming to him, asking him if they could observe him working with clients. So they might spend a whole day and record what went on between him and the clients and then go back to the hotel room because they were writing an article or a book and transcribe all of this and spend, you know, the group of them spend the whole night talking about what they'd heard and what they thought Ericsson was doing. And then they would go in the next day and start asking him questions and he would begin to speak and speak and speak for hours <laughs> and apparently with no connection at all with what he'd been, what he'd originally said. Now, there are those who think that's because Ericsson didn't know what he was doing. I I actually think it's because Ericsson knew that if he gave people a manual, if he said that there was this approach, then that's what people would cling to because they want clarity. They want simplicity. They want to be able to, to copy and to emulate. It's a very natural human instinct. And that's why there's 150 different schools. Now, I know there will be those who disagree with this and who say that they are CBT therapists or this kind of therapist or that sort of therapist. And that's fine. But it just, it appealed to me because I hated the thought of doing the same thing time after time, day after day with different clients. And for an individual who is thinking of getting a bit of therapy and finding a therapist, and let's face it, we're in the middle of a pandemic, so who isn't? How does a person find someone who is a good fit? I'd suggest if you're if you're struggling with your mental health, the first thing is to go to your GP and they may well be able to give you a, a referral. Certainly they can put you onto a mental health care plan I'm talking about specifically here in Victoria. And at the moment, because of current circumstances, that can mean 20 sessions in, in the year. But if you know someone and you almost certainly do know someone who's been to see somebody and you like, you, you like and trust their, their opinion, then I'd be inclined to ask around because, as we were saying before, that that relationship is so important that you've got to feel comfortable. You've got to feel that that person really, as I said before, sees you and is responding to you as an individual and is not just going through a, re a repetitive process. So ask around, look at their website. And as I said before, do not be afraid to, to walk away. If you're finding it's not working for you, and you should know pretty soon, you know, you might, it might take you perhaps several sessions. But as soon as you begin to feel that this is working, then you can commit and really get down to work. And as soon as you really feel that this is not working for you, then it's probably not that it's not for you. It's just that this person is not for you. I like a bit of mental mental health support. I do. I don't think people should should wait until they're in extremis. It's a bit like going for a massage for me, just getting to to sit and and yes. uh, and talk and talk about myself. I think it's it's a really important thing for anyone. Yes, it's becoming, I think, much more acceptable, even in the 20 years that I've been in Australia, it's become much more acceptable to go and get some help in this area. And I think that can only be a good thing. I actually think that it's replacing something that would have been done in other ways, or is being done in other ways in other cultures in other ways of living. It may not be entirely disconnected from the fact that we do not respect our elders greatly in, uh, how do I express this in, I was going to say in Australia, some cultures in Australia do, but a lot of cultures, I think the culture that I came from, um, a sort of an Anglo culture, elders are not respected, their wisdom is not sought. We're all so busy these days and we manage to occupy ourselves with so many things. And yet the research is clear that some things that seem so obvious and seem so trivial like getting out there and being in nature, just getting some exposure to trees and wind and the sea and the hills, the mountains, that makes a real difference. It makes a really big difference to people and particularly to children. 
But it does remind me of something that uh, Rob Gordon, who was the, the psychologist for, for Victoria when the, the bushfires went through in 2009, that's when I spent some time with, with Rob. He, he likes to say that everything works for someone, nothing works for everyone. And in fact, the research seems to support that, that if you want to go and see a psychic because you feel some connection in that direction, if you, if you want to light candles and meditate, if that's what works for you, do that, do that. And don't let anybody tell you that it's nonsense or hokum because you actually do know what, what you need and what will stimulate you and, and comfort you. Maybe on another episode, we should talk about your pathway from training as a priest to <laughs> becoming a therapist and whether there is a, a similarity there. Coming soon on the Bloom podcast. <laughs> Welcome, Mark. <laughs> Thanks, Steve and Susie, for having me on your podcast. How do you describe yourself when people ask you, when they ask you this question, Mark, how do you describe yourself? How do you answer? I always start off with my title, actually, because I've got used to it after 30 years. It was always funny to, to think of myself as a doctor. But I, yes, it's part of my whole life now. So I say, yeah, I'm Mark Cross. I'm a doctor. I'm Australian and, of course, South African born. Um, a gay man met his husband in John, who who I, I met in London. We've been together twenty years, and a father. I never thought I'd say that. Actually, it's it's quite incredible to be able to say that. Uh, we have two sons, ten and seven. Clem's just turned ten, and I suppose that would be it. And and then saying, okay, I'm a psychiatrist and an author, uh, and that makes it sound like such a, a a wonderful, comfortable journey. And yet, it's been anything but that. <laughs> So yes, I had trauma, but, but again, I had an idyllic childhood on one level, apart from the fact that I was anxious and, and knew I was different. Uh, you know, I wasn't beaten or bullied or anything dreadful. Just had to make my own way around who I was um, with its own issues. But, you know, South Africa in the 70s when I was growing up, you know, we, we rode our bicycles, we went outside. It was, it was, a, it was a different era, of course. Although I did present, I presented at the Workplace Wellness Festival yesterday and talking about anxiety. And when I was about five, because people ask, you know, when did you first know you were anxious? I, I developed night terrors. And my father around that time, five to six, lost his job betting on stocks that didn't bear as much fruit as he'd hoped. And we had to move into a boarding house. And then to my grandmother's house, and I started bedwetting, and I developed a, a specific reading disorder. And of course, I'm an avid reader. I mean, anyway, and of course, the teacher made great fun of that. So I don't, I don't miss the seventies. Put it that way. Do you think the anxiety was a result of of that the, those experiences, or do you think it's in in the blood? Or I think there's an inherent uh, anxiety. You know, uh, I, I dedicated the book to my mother who's living in South Africa now with my father and her mother. And both, you know, there's a f very strong family history of anxiety. There's also a strong family history of bipolar affective disorder as well as huge alcoholism on both sides. And, of course, you, you look back as a psychiatrist, you know, medical doctor, I look at my medical history. It was never discussed, but my mother had two first cousins suicide and I had a first cousin suicide. Her brother my middle uncle just died uh, he had bipolar and when you when you look at it like that and there's always been a manic quality to my anxiety I, I also I looked at her and that wasn't discussed you know when we were growing up and I looked at a photo of the cousin who died he was a beautiful man and I think actually it's been told to me he, he, that he was gay and there was never so that, that was the reason he killed himself and Mark how do we, as as we're all three of us are on on this discussion of parents, how do we make sure we don't repeat that that pain down the generations? How do we protect ourselves and our, our children from it? The short answer is don't be assholes to your children. You know, when we think about the seventies, and I think about my uncle as well, he was always making disparaging comments so it, to his kids. And when you look at how you bring up kids and Often people go, oh, you can't prevent mental illness. Well, of course you can. It's, it's so much, so much of it is preventable. And it's just about letting your children be who they are and not forcing them to be 
somebody they don't want to be or don't feel ready or right to be going with the grain i suppose rather than trying to shape them as you as you want them to be don't try and beat out the you in your child and and, and it's so funny because my older child is mine biologically and he's got a bit of attention issues and <laughs> won't stop and oh my god and every now and then i get a bit short-tempered with him and i was on the phone to my mother the, the other day and i said oh god Clem is doing this and he's doing that and she just laughed i went what she said oh my god you were the same <laughs> how dare you mother <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and I remember it's so funny I remember eating a table and always drinking water it used to drive my father nuts and now Clem does it I keep on saying darling just eat and then you can drink your water and I suddenly I had this deja vu moment I'm going oh my god <laughs> so you know just allow them to be and it's and it's just it's just wonderful because there are people, right? But I think the answer is treat them as your kids, but also treat them as the people they are and are going to become right from an early age. Mark, perhaps we should try and identify the, the nature of, of the beast. Everyone knows, or I guess I think they know what anxiety is. We all get anxious, but I, I suspect that that's not what you're really what you're really focusing on, what you're really looking at. It's of a, a different order, isn't it? Anxiety itself is that fight or flight, those fight or flight symptoms. You know, when you see the big bear lumbering around the fence and all of a sudden you can jump it and your eyes dilate and your heart pumps. And that's what you get when you're just sitting on your porch, you know, having a cup of lemonade with your friend and all of a sudden this will happen. That's how I sort of differentiate it because often people don't know what anxiety is or they don't understand it as a disorder or a condition. Because they go, well, everyone gets anxious, right? And of course we do. For exams, we have those sort of responses. But it's when there's not that external threat, then it's, you know, people can understand it more as a condition. So, yes, I do look at it in a medical way uh, a lot of the time. But, of course, there are different forms of anxiety, including PTSD, for instance. And then you're looking at trauma and dealing and helping the person deal as much as you can with that trauma. There's nothing necessarily wrong with anxiety in, in itself. It's just, it's just, I suppose, how much of it you get and the context, is it? Yes, I suppose I've been asked this, okay, there must be an evolutionary reason why we have anxiety around, right? And, of course, it's... It's it's made us the top species on the planet, apart from Corona now. But it's basically led us evolve, led us to evolve as a dominant species. You need anxiety in order to survive. Unfortunately, it's that survival anxiety kicks in when you don't need it. Then it's horrible. Um, that's one of the ways I look at it, I suppose. And of course, anxiety has also it's not all horrible. It's allowed me or made me the person I am and driven me too much at times because you know that's and then you get exhausted but it, there are some positives to it and you, you're unusual in in that you're a psychiatrist who uh, is very comfortable or or at least you're willing to talk about to talk about this when when so often i think we perhaps as lay people expect our professionals to have this reserve and either to be perfect or at least to give the the illusion of, of being perfect well i'm unusual in many ways you're right um but <laughs> And, and of course, I've used humor to deflect that because, you know, it's a difficult thing because I said in the film I made after my book, uh, Beneath the Stigma, it was, it was amazing. 13 people in my book and myself talk about stigma and, and, and the difficulties we have with anxiety. And actually, I said, as a doctor, I still have difficulty accepting or acknowledging anxiety. I almost find it easier to talk about being gay. And trust me, that was bloody hard for decades. Then being a doctor with anxiety, because you've hit the nail on the head. I was trained to have that stiff upper lip, not sharing of oneself, not sharing personal issues, and certainly not sharing any what we would consider as a weakness. And of course, I've always ignored that. But again, so, you know, Steve, I'm 55 this year, I have to accept these things. And with age, surely comes some wisdom. So in a way, I'm thinking, well, you know, if it's, if, if it's the end of my career, I'd love it. My husband thinks I should work till I'm 92. But, you know, 
if it's going to be the end of my career, there are other things that I can do. But unfortunately, it's not. I'm so busy. <laughs> so, so obviously, me being open about myself doesn't mean that people don't want to see me. That's the take-home message, I suppose, for me. How did you get to be doing what you're doing, Mark? Was it to do with your sexuality, to do with the anxiety? Was it just ambition or some combination of all of those things? You know, when you know you're different when you're young and you have anxiety and you you try to hide you well you hide it all the time and you strive to be what's considered normal you know in the 1970s in south africa as in australia and new zealand masculinity wasn't held up so much as an ideal it was beaten into you so it it was something that i had to strive to to be so i excelled in academics athletics always though at the core of me feeling that i wasn't living up to the ideal and, and living up to what my parents expected of me and feeling horrible about myself because I knew there was this thing in me that I didn't want and 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 didn't need. And it took ages and ages to to come to terms with that. So in a way, if you look at it positively, yes, it made me strive to be better. And a lot of my gay friends and patients and colleagues say exactly the same thing. And so talking about the LGBTQ community a lot of them were overachievers because of just that if you were growing up now when the person that you are a, a gay person as a as a teenager as a, a a young adult hopefully much in a in a much more accepting society do you think you would have been as high an achiever? Oh, yeah, the anxiety is still there, right? So, of course, it's so much of my anxiety is linked to my sexuality per se. But again, I have that strong family history, strong learned behavior of my mother's being anxious and my grandmother. So I don't think so. I think it would have been easier, though, because so much has changed in the last 25 years. So from when I graduated in 1990, that was the year the International Classification of Diseases, so the World Health Organization tome of disease classification, took out homosexuality as, a, as an illness. It was only in 1990. And, 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 and so I went through my entire medical training with homosexuality not only being a criminal offense, but it was a mental illness. So that didn't help at all, obviously. That's a, a shocking thought that only 30 years ago it was still, there was something wrong with you if you, if you, if you were gay. In 1990 when I graduated, and you probably worked out by now, I wasn't a brilliant student. I was involved in student politics and um, you know, I was the president of the Work Avoidance Society. Um, I attended a board of faculty meeting. So I went to the University of Cape Town. So one could argue that it's you know one of the top universities in Africa, and it's, you know, wonderful and a great medical f uh, faculty. And at the board of faculty meeting, the then professor of surgery, Arsol de Blanche, um, stood up and castigated the then openly gay professor of infectious diseases and immunology, who was saying quite clearly, HIV is this huge issue, people. We need to deal with it. And the professor of surgery stood up and said, it's God's gift to homosexuals. In the meeting, in the meeting, in 1990, and after that, the government of the day was still held by puritanical principles, you know, the apartheid government. And the Afrikaans Women's Movement, so much, much more powerful than our Country Women's Association, who knows at the time, would not allow condoms to be advertised because it would lead to loosening of morality so you know people don't understand that that was 1990 you've come a long way baby you asked earlier am i more open and is it easier yes i think being open and confronting these things and talking about them but i was obviously also having a loving family and support and speaking to people like you guys and and, and showing the world that we have changed we are a better place Mm. Although there's still hate and there's still difficult and people are still suiciding. You know, our indigenous youth, our, our young brothers and sisters, if they're LGBTQ, are 10 times more likely to kill themselves than the, uh, you know, the average population. So there, there's stats like that still horrible. There is, there is so much badness still in the world. Sure, but, you know, and it was a dreadful time, don't get me wrong. So took, looking at my book, it took me much longer to write than I should have. Also, I didn't quite know where I was going, but we got there. But at the beginning when I started writing it, it was the marriage equality so-called debate and postal vote. 
And so I had <laughs> patients, colleagues, friends, all crying in my office on the phone. And of course, I took a lot of that in because it was a dreadful time to have ourselves so exposed and, and discussed. And I'm glad my, my kids are too young to actually have gone through all that. But you know what? 62% of the voting population in Australia voted. Let's, I mean, that's still amazing. So every now and then when I go into dark places and we talk about dark things, I go, you know what, two-thirds of the country, two-thirds of the country believe in equality. And, you know, Australia is still a wonderful place to live and there's, there's hope. Mark, what does the evidence say? What works if, for people who experience anxiety in the way you've been described? What do they do about it? I think the first step is to acknowledge it. I mean, I think that acceptance because self-stigma is just the worst kind of stigma as I keep on saying it's taken me a long time to get to that point and so with acknowledgement comes acceptance and you can then get help and you don't beat yourself up about it and project all that horrible stuff onto your loved ones and you know that's that's what happens or then you drink or take drugs or run from it for so long when you finally say, hey, this is me, this is what I'm dealing with, I can get help. And then, you know, the journey's better. You're halfway there almost. And I think I always look at these sort of questions, or I'll answer them like this. I look at a four-pronged approach to treatment, right? So your biopsychosocial. So the bio is the medical stuff we talked about a little bit earlier. Your inherent vulnerability, including your genetics, family history, and then I always look at medication there. And medication has a place in a holistic way. The psychological is, okay, what caused you to think like this? Let's help you unthink it in a mindful way, help you cope with the day-to-day -day living issues by formulating strategies. And that's where mindfulness comes in. Stay in the present, focus on what you're doing. But that underpins most modern folks' therapies, actually. Social you know, I can't give someone a pill if they're homeless and getting beaten up. So you've got to look at those things and when you can shift and change things when you can, including there, I look at drugs and alcohol and, you know, using it mindfully and accepting that it's not your friend and it's not actually helping you long term. And then the fourth arm is the lifestyle stuff. My holy trinity, as my patients call it, in every session I discuss diet, sleep and exercise. Well, how do you actually do that? If you're if you're sitting there thinking, I really need to be exercising, I know I should be exercising, I I, I should not be eating this donut. How do you how do you move beyond that? How do you get there? You cannot let shame and guilt. So if you're having that donut, you go, Hey, I'm really enjoying this donut in a mindful way, but tomorrow I'm going to eat more healthily and plan it. Uh, you can't see my arms, but I, I go on the, on this side. I'll give you the evidence, and we'll talk about the theory. And we all know that McDonald's is bad for us, but for goodness sake, we've got to live as well. So it's a balance. And I, at the risk of sounding like a, you know, a yogi guru, which I'm not, I look at balance. So on this side, I go, okay, how can we apply to you? What do you think you can do to shift things for yourself? And hey, this takes a long time sometimes. But every year now for seven years, and you've got to lead by example, right? John and I have done a what we call Feb fast. So we give up a whole lot of stuff. The first day we gave up caffeine, nearly divorced each other. Don't do that again. Mm -hmm. Don't give up caffeine. But give up sugar, meat, dairy, and um, alcohol. And, you know, by the end of the month, you measure liver functions go down, cholesterol goes down, sleep improves, anxiety improves, and you feel slimmer. And then, of course, we start drinking again. Oh, there you go. But hey, <laughs> each year I give up something. And so next month will be an anniversary of giving up meat. I haven't had meat. As a South African boy, I have not eaten meat for a year. And we can all do it to, at a certain time of our lives. We can go, you know what? I want to take a little bit more control. But it has to work for you. In a positive way, you go, I'm going to get out of bed when the alarm goes off. I'm going to do a few stretches five days a week. I like the 5-2 rule. I like the intermittent fasting. So you don't have breakfast straight away. Go for a little walk, drink some water, eat later, eat somewhere 10-ish to 6-7-ish and nothing in between. Everyone can do that. Cut down on sugar and processed food. But on the weekends, you can let yourself go a little bit. There you go, Susie. There's your formula. Are you happy with that? You, you <laughs> ready to get going? <laughs> I, I am. And I, actually, I've been doing that. Uh...
exactly that, that eating between 10 and 7 lately. Um, and um, I was just thinking, I wonder if I agreed to give up sugar if I could get my husband to give up alcohol. But I don't think, I'm not sure who it would be more painful for. <laughs> Small steps. But again, I started just by moderation. You know, everyone talks about the old wives, right? They knew what they were talking about. The old wives said, you know, everything in moderation. So that's the way I look at it. Including moderation. <laughs> Including moderation, yes. There's this group of... Um, rich people in the east coast of america and they live in this compound and they've got everything the money can buy and they're all slim and tall and they get chefs to come in and make them a glop every day and they don't go out they don't drink they don't smoke and they all believe they can live to 120 so i go good for you but oh my god what a boring life you won't live longer but you'll feel as though you do <laughs> <It's> exactly like <laughs> And I don't want to, I always sound like I'm plugging myself, but you know, I'm doing this funny little vodcast um, called The Anxious Shrink. Obviously, The Anxious Shrink, Neurotic Shrink, you know, it's all about being neurotic, right? Um, that's on Facebook. We're doing live on Thursdays now. Actually, that's what I'm doing after this at 7.30. So if you want to have a little squiz at that, it's actually quite fun. And we're reaching quite a few people, and it's about staying connected in this time. And I think that's a lovely thing. Like, you doing this, I'm doing that. You talk about how we how we stay well. It's doing things like that and staying connected with a whole lot of people. So a whole lot of my patients come on um, and have a look and interaction. And I think that's lovely and it's a great way to go forward. So, Mark, if we if people want to find out more about you, should they go and have a look at The Anxious Shrink or some of your books or what would you recommend? Um, yeah, it's always difficult for me to be saying, but actually my book's doing well and it's, and it's, and it's great. I'm proud of it now and it's, it's, it's a wonderful feeling actually. It deserves to, yeah. And, and thank you for that. I re it really means a lot to me. It really does. And because you put yourself out there and of course it does cause anxiety, right? Um, but I've had nothing but positive response. Um, but hashtag the anxious shrink. So we, we, we're going to take that uh, a little bit further. Um, so if you want to look, there's some, Past episodes on YouTube, but actually we're doing weekly thing now on, on Facebook, so it's only 20 minutes. What a, what a great idea for connection at this time, I think, is what, what everyone's striving for. And it's great. And I've got a, a very secure fan base of 70-plus women. <laughs> <laughs> They're the best kind. They are indeed. <laughs> oh, so thank you so much, Mark. It's really been a, been a pleasure having you. No, thank you so much as well. For having me thank you mark you guys are going you guys are really lovely thanks for listening to the bloom podcast if you like it tell a friend and we'd love it if you'd write a review and give us five stars on the apple podcast side the bloom podcast is at bloomcast.com.au and wherever you get your podcasts <laughs>